Coming up next on Arizona Horizons, Journalists Roundtable will have the latest on the battle over Medicaid expansion. Attorney General Tom Horn comes to an agreement with Bisbee over the city's civil union ordinance. And the governor vetoes a bill that would make gold and silver legal tender in Arizona. Those stories and more next on the Journalists Roundtable. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining me tonight are Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Mary Kay Reinhardt from the Arizona Republic. Well, a few bills were signed and some legislation was vetoed, but still no definitive word on the big issue at the Capitol. Uh, Mary Jo, is anything going on with Medicaid expansion, talks, negotiations? Oh, a lot's going on with Medicaid expansion, just not very publicly. There, yeah. There's a lot of talks. The governor's still pressing for her desire to have the legislature just pass the darn thing and um, give her a bill and pass it. Um, and the legislature's pushing back against that. And here we are, 110 days into the legislative session and no end in sight. And the problem is that uh, in some ways the dust up over the whole abortion thing is is undermining that strength and as she tries to reach out to to placate that particular group then you've got Chad Campbell saying well wait a second you know we're not just gonna go just go along with anything and so she's trying to put this jello together and the mold keeps coming apart what is the dust up over the abortion thing the dust up over the abortion thing it started a month or so ago with a letter and a, and a legal opinion from a, a Christian uh, legal organization that, that Kathy Harrod with the Center for Arizona Policy uh, then passed on to the governor and said, you know, we think that Medicaid expansion uh, subsidizes abortions, which is what she's been saying all along. It was uh, contained in Senate Bill 2800, um, which the governor signed and it was promptly challenged by the ACLU and Planned Parenthood, which basically says um, that any, you know, what, what, what Kathy Harrod and folks think it, in, on that side is that a dollar for any organization that does family planning, even if it doesn't uh, provide, even if it doesn't go directly to abortions, because federal and state law prohibit that, goes to subsidize abortions. Now, uh, U.S. District Judge Neil Wake has, has enjoined that a law, that, or Bill 2800. Um, the language that Kathy Harrod has now come up with, uh, she hopes can get around that, but what what I think Republicans feel, uh, even uh, opponents of Medicaid expansion think it's just a, it's just cover. It's just really, uh, I think uh, Senator Ward actually was talking to me, to Kelly Ward said it's just pulling the wool over people's eyes if they think that this language is actually going to, to do anything. It's really just political cover for people who want to vote for Medicaid expansion, Republicans on the fence who otherwise we might have some trouble if Kathy Harrod's running around saying this is an anti-life bill. Right, because the, the plan is to take this um, this language it would say we're not going to use any of this expansion money for abortion we'll put it in a separate bill and we can let people vote on that and you know so that'll keep the the democrats can vote against it because we know they don't like that but then they can still vote for a pure medicaid expansion but that's why mary Kay says it's 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 just cover it's it, but it's sort of meaningless cover but because it, it doesn't really have but, it's, but, it's, but the meaningless cover becomes look <laughs> how many years have we all been covering the legislature so much meaningless cover is what buys the votes sometimes exactly. and and that becomes the issue you know, you've got folks in the middle. Look, Kelly Ward is not going to vote for Medicaid expansion. She st stood out in the lawn a couple of weeks ago and said Medicaid is substandard care, which is pretty interesting since, in fact, it's managed care and the same kind of insurance that, that, that probably most of us have. But the, the question becomes those folks in the middle, that, that, the, the, those, you know, the Paul Boyers, if you will, of the world, and perhaps some of the other moderate Republicans who are afraid of Kathy Herod, they're afraid of the Center for Arizona Policy, and, and are scared that if they are seen as a pro-choice vote somehow, that's going to hurt him in a primary. I mean, you know, really at, at, the, at the core of this is just sausage making, you know, is how he <laughs> says it goes on every single year at the legislature and every legislature in the country and always has. It's, it's trading. It's what do I need to get these guys on board without getting these guys falling off? And the Democrats right now are saying, you know, you, you better not be playing games with Medicaid expansion. We've been behind you 100 percent all session long. You need every one of our votes, not just a few of them. And so they've got a they've got a, a pretty big chit in this whole debate. With that, <laughs> with that in mind, how likely that we would see a separate bill? Um, well, the governor's office says they believe they've got to have it. 
to make to make this thing go. So probably very likely. And my point about it being meaningless, yes, this it, it's you're right. It's all vo vote trading. And but at the end of the day, will it substantively make a d um, a difference? And people are saying most people are saying no. And how? Why would this not have legal problems on its own? Oh well, the bill that was signed last year and enjoined simply said, if you uh, Medicaid covers family planning. The bill that was passed last year said if you also provide abortion services, you can't get family planning money. And what the judge said, and it's very clear, is federal law says you can't tie that. This bill simply says no money for family planning can be used to subsidize abortions. But then it has this provision in there of what, what any sort of subsidy means directly, indirectly, lighting, uh, utilities, and directs, mandates that access audit the books of anybody and that gives them the proof that they say was l lacking last year to prove that there is a cross subsidization. What about emergency life saving abortion, that particular procedure? Federal well, funds with that's federal. That's not in there. And that's a concern of some of the Democrats that, that this, is just, this language just deals with expansion funds. It doesn't deal with any money that we've already gotten. But there is a concern that because there's nothing in there that says save the life of the mother, uh, rape or incest, which is what state and federal law still allow, yes, yes. that, you know, Dr. Eric Meyer, who's in the House, said, you know, a provider is an emergency room and if a woman comes in there and she needs an abortion to save her life under this language we got to choose between do we want to jeopardize all of our Medicaid funding mm -hmm. or do we want to save this woman's life and that's not a choice that they want to make and that's clear but again it may be there's no language that's going to satisfy everybody right. so we'll just <laughs> as Mary Jo says we'll just we'll just play it covering the wool over people's eyes and see if we can pretend that we'll hold our nose and vote for it well and the question I have too is maybe not another issue as as, as volcanic as, as abortion, but there will be others. And we'll be seeing in the next few weeks other little thorny issues, other little bills, other little pieces of language that are going to raise their heads and say, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this in order to but, get these votes together. But the real together. key is, and this is where the governor needs some spine and a backbone, is to say, look, you're not going to vote for this anyway. You know, tell the Kelly Wards of the world, you're not going to vote for this anyway. So I want leadership to do some leading, I can give you the Democratic votes, find me the Republicans, and we'll make it happen. And at some point, the governor's going to need to say no. So far, she's proven with this abortion thing. Two weeks ago, she insisted we weren't going to add abortions to this. Two weeks ago. Now it was, well, maybe we will. She needs the spine. Is, okay, with, with, so with all that in mind, is this going to wind up being referred to the ballot? Are we going to have to make this tough decision? It could. Um, if people, nobody, well, the governor is saying no way. Um, President Biggs says no way. You know, this is what people are elected to do. We're, we're really not sure where the speaker is on this. So, but, but that is definitely um, a plan B. And I will say in terms of Howie's comment that the governor maybe needs to get a spine, I mean, I think she's trying to still work the little charm offensive. She sent him all a cookie yesterday. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yes. With a little note on it, urging lawmakers to wrap up work, pointing out, you know, it's getting hot outside and let's just beat the heat. And it was just a sort of a nice little subtle way to say, let's, let's wrap this up. Well, I mean, and as soon as you start talking about ballot language, you've, you've given up, right? You're not, you're not anymore yeah. talking about getting 16 and 31 in the legislature. And right now, I think there's still a feeling that they can get those votes. They've got them in the Senate. They need to get Andy Tobin over to their side, whatever he wants. We don't know quite what he wants, but he may be gettable. And if you get him, you get a whole bunch of other folks and you, you, you get it started over in the House and then it comes to the Senate and boom, you're done. And after all Sounds this, easy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And after all that, which is yeah, wonderfully easy, um, how long before a lawsuit says uh, you, need, you needed two thirds? <laughs> by the way. Oh, well, okay. you, you might as well count on that. I mean, I can, I can foresee, you know, whether it's Tom Jenny's group challenging it. It's an interesting question. You know, the, the court has essentially said that you can give department heads power to levy fees to cover their costs. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do with Department of Real Estate, do with Department of Insurance. This is a little different. This isn't the Arizona health care cost containment system levying a fee on hospitals to cover access as operating costs. It covers the cost of the expansion plus another hundred million for, for the, beyond the expansion and the structure of the fee is still to be worked out. This is where it's getting interesting. I mean we had an incident with Scottsdale Healthcare said which doesn't like the fee 
but said we want to be at the table to make sure that the fee is structured in such a way that we like it. Now, are lawmakers ready to give the director of access the power to, to, to set up a fee in a structure he likes? No, but that's part of the language I think we'll see if this thing keeps moving is some, some language that puts some uh, audit over, additional audits or oversights on access. There's a big concern about what, how we just discussed, which is, which is a gajillion dollars basically at the, in the hands of, of one state agency, which, you know, it's really not, but whatever. They want, a, they want more oversight. And, but, and this whole debate over is this a tax or not, that is another argument for sending it to the ballot. Just let, mm -hmm. let, let the voters yeah, decide. Yeah. Um, there's a belief that this would have strong well, public support, and you can, you know, and, and then lawmakers get cover That's because right. they can say, I didn't vote for a tax yeah. increase. In fact, I didn't vote for Medicaid expansion. I just put it out there. But somebody the argued folk. to me that the other day that there could be a, 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 a lawsuit either way, that if, if they ah. do force a two-thirds vote then and, and then it doesn't pass, right. <laughs> that somebody's going to sue over that and right. say there was no, you know, there, they didn't need there, a two-thirds vote. There's one other interim step that I think needs to be taken, and the governor's trying to short-circuit it, which is can we get continued federal money for childless adults after the end of the year? Now, the governor said she sent a letter to Center for Medicaid and Medicare Studies and got back, not as direct response, but an FAQ. Right. And used that to say, look, we can't do that. Well, that wasn't a direct answer. It may take the governor physically submitting an application, having that application rejected to prove to those folks it, it, you can't well, do it any other but way. That's not a small matter to, no. to, to, to submit that application. She's not about to do it, right? Because she doesn't want it. And mm -hmm. so what, the, what, what Andy Biggs has said is their alternative proposal, the folks that oppose mm -hmm. Medicaid expansion, part of that alternative proposal would be to, to require access to submit that official waiver request and get an answer for sure one way or the other. All right, so uh, I think we covered that one as far as we can go. We of course, beat that yeah, movie. and the next week we'll probably go over the same ground again. So, what does that tell you about the length of the session and why we're we're in it, May? And it tells still me that the air conditioner better be working down there because uh, you guys are going to get warm. All right, let's talk about some things that did happen regarding a veto of a bill that makes gold legal, ten, gold and silver legal tender. First of all. What does that mean? <laughs> that means that you could use, uh, under the language of the bill, um, it, you could you could have used gold and silver to pay your debts, to buy stuff, um, but it was voluntary. So there would have been no requirement on merchants um, or service providers to accept that as payment, but it would have been another form of payment, um, and it's grounded in the belief that you know the, the Fed's just not you know, the, the dollar is not strong, the Federal Reserve is going to collapse, and we need some, we need some, some kind of strong well, currency happening even as gold and silver prices have been yeah. declining. Well, what's fascinating is, look, there is nothing against, if I want to buy something for Mary Jo, and she wants to take a gold nugget, a gold ingot as payment, we can do that now. You do not need state legislation. Now, the, what the governor found, and she, she, she saw the the rest of the story, which is the tax implications. Right now, if I buy pork bellies, I buy it here, sell it there, I have to pay capital gains on the difference. This bill had a provision saying, well, gold and silver bullion and coins are legal tender, and therefore they're not a commodity, and therefore the investors don't have to pay capital gains. This was a special bill in a lot of ways for gold and silver investors, which I'm sure, you know, I. I don't in fact happen to have the resources for that, but this was really a special bill, and the governor said, "Now wait a second. So if we pass this, no capital gains, less state revenue. Why would I want to do that? Uh, will we see this something like this again? Is this a kind? Is this an evergreen kind of a <laughs> oh, thing? Do you think? You, you mean along with the the UN's Agenda. out to get us? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Of course. Of course All we right. will. All right. So we will see it again. Maybe we'll see a Bitcoin bill next time. Too. <laughs> well, yeah, we probably will. You're right. Um, the governor did sign a resign to run bill. What is that all about? This is basically a further erosion of this resign to run law, which frankly sort of looks like it all gets winked and nodded at as, as it is. Um, and, and basically it says, uh, at, with the governor's signature, if you, want, if you are in the, not in the last year of your term and you want to run for another office, you, the only way you violate resign to run now would be to actually formally file paperwork to say, I am leaving, I'm going to move on and, and run for governor. Right. Um, so this just, this removes yet another barrier um, on the resign to run. Right. Provision. For years we've had people, you know, getting their nominating petitions together. It really has been a sort of a wink and a nod. Does for that a long mean time. Ted's exploratory committee business is going to be going out of business? Yes, well, I think so. Oh. Well, that's the thing, and that's been the game. I mean, we had Al Melvin announce. 
announce I'm exploring governor. And he said, I am running, but I can't say I'm running because I'm not in the last year of his term. And it really has been, a, a, as Mary Jo says, a wink and a nod. It, it, it's been kind of a scam. They, they, you, know, you can raise money. You can get your petition signatures. You, you, can, you, you can print up your signs. And yeah. as long as you don't make that magic I am running, file the declaration. Boy, those exploratory they're, committees, are, they're going to be awfully lonely, Howie. they got nothing to do anymore. Well, I know, but that's okay. We'll have, we'll have enough fun in the race. I mean, you know, between you know, Al Melvin and Andy Thomas, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, the governor <laughs> also signed a gun buyback bill, and this basically targeted, what, cities, municipalities, and their gun buyback, but only municipal run buyback. I mean, if you're a private entity, you can do your own buyback but, but, program. But I think that's the point. You know, the argument is that if a city comes into possession of an asset, you shouldn't be able to destroy the asset. And, you know, there is something to be said, well, that gun is worth money and you should use it to uh, go ahead and, and pay off the city debts or, or, or help police. The argument, obviously, of the foes is, look, there are families that, you know, the, the kid turns a certain age or they find a gun under the kid's bed or something like that. They want it destroyed. They don't want it sold. I mean, they could sell it now. They could take it to a gun store, which is why you bring it to the city, knowing what will happen to it. This simply says once it's in the city's possession, it has to be sold. Now, as you point out, there's a way around this. I mean, you, you get a nonprofit to go ahead, do, you know, come up with the money, come up with the, the $50 Safeway gift cards that, that they've been doing. You can have police officers there to make sure the weapons aren't wanted. But as long as they don't come into to possession of the city, you can take care of it. It was a lot of smoke for, for something that's more political than, than real. And, and I think got, the city of Phoenix is hurrying up to do a gun exactly. buyback program right before exactly. the deadline. Though. So yes. it means something. And it, it got it quite it a response harder. from lawmakers, too, didn't it? I mean, this, this, this got a lot of blowback. Uh, well, from, from the Democrats, yes. you know, who, who oppose this legislation. And they tried to make the, the broader point that here we are in, in the first legislative session to happen after the shootings in Newtown and the last summer shooting in Aurora. Um, and what's the legislature do but pass another bill that, as the Democrats view it, you know, further loosen controls on guns, you know, where they would like to see the equation go the other way. Well, and, and, and the, the great line is that Arizona is a state that does more to protect guns from people than people from guns. Or we have, as somebody else said, our own pro-life movement for, for weapons. It's also yet another example of the state telling municipalities what to do. I'm shocked. Yeah, the well, eternal debate. Yes, oh, exactly. Okay. All right, uh, uh, Tom Horn in the news for a couple of reasons here. Let's start with the Bisbee Civil Union uh, change there. What, what, was, what was this all about here? This, Bisbee passed an ordinance saying we are going to allow people to register as a civil union. Now, this isn't terribly unusual. Phoenix and Tucson have domestic partner registries, for example, so does Flagstaff. It also says, again, not surprisingly, you can have hospital visits, uh, you can get the family rate at the local pool. Where they went a little over the edge is they also listed some other things that they'd like to honor, like inheritance and community property. Well, you can't do that. Those are state laws. Now, the ordinance itself said, to the extent allowed by law, we will do this. Tom Horn, you know, who's got a few other problems, decided to beat his chest and say, well, if you do this, I'm going to sue you. So they got together. The, the uh, Lambda Legal came in on behalf of the city of Bisbee, and they sat down and said, I'll tell you what, you can list these other things that people should do, like wills and, and inheritance and joint tenancy with right of survivorship, but you have to list that somewhere else in the law. So essentially... It was a win-win. Horn said, look, I got him to back off, and the city of Bisbee said, we've still got the ordinance the way we want. We've just reworded it. Horn look okay after something like this? What do you, what do you think? Well, it looked like everybody sat down together and actually talked about yes. stuff and came to a conclusion. And I think for other cities like Tempe who are looking into this issue to see how far they can go, this was at least helpful to them to know how far the attorney general is going to let them go. Right, because I, I think the attorney general got a lot of heat when he first said, I'm going to sue you if you do X, Y, and Z. Right. Yet he winds up getting a discussion, and it sounds and like Bisbee wound up making yeah. a change. And Appearing at the same news conference with Lambda Legal, and so it's like exactly. a kumbaya moment. Um, this and, 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 and another incident here, Howie, uh, where Tom Horn kind of won, but uh, well, kind of won, but still he's uh, on, the, on, the, on the plank there. It's, it's, it's a, uh, shall we call it a temporary victory. Uh, this goes back to the 2010 race. Horn was running. Kathleen Wynne was on his committee for his primary. Then for the general formed this uh, Business Leaders for Arizona. It's supposed to be an independent campaign committee, which 
suddenly Tom's running behind at the last minute because the Democratic AGs are taking an ad against him. They spend half a million dollars, some of which came from some of Horn's uh, in-laws and yes. brother or something. And they run a last minute ad and Horn pulls out a squeaker. Well, as we all know by now, somehow the FBI got involved, followed him around, you know, his gold Jaguar, the baseball cap and everything else, but nothing came out of that. But what did come out of that was an, a, a belief that there was enough contact between Horn and Wynn to suggest they were coordinating. That runs afoul of campaign finance laws, which say you can't do that. What happened basically, Secretary of State decided, well, law says I'm supposed to refer it to Horn, but that doesn't make sense, so he refers it to Bill Montgomery. Right. The court, what the court said is, look, yeah, we understand there's a conflict there, but you, the law means yeah, something. You've you got to you, you follow the law. You've got to give it to Horn. Now, if he decides he has a conflict, and to a certain extent Mike Kimmer or his attorney is admitting that, he gets to farm it out. Now, the question becomes here is, to whom does he farm it out and what happens? It's not likely to be a Bill Montgomery. Oh, it's definitely not likely. He, he said and, it'll be over his cold, dead body. It'll right. Be Bill Montgomery. And, and Montgomery's been told by the judge to, to knock it off. You, you stop right here until uh, further. Yeah. I have one question, though. Must Horn refer it out? Uh, well, let, let's put it this way. Um, if he doesn't, um, I think there would be a state bar complaint against him, and uh, you know that becomes a problem. He clearly has a conflict. The judge said, in fact, is one of the things that came out during the hearing, is you know that he thinks that Horn has 1.5 million in conflicts, which is the yeah. amount of the fine. Right. If in fact he he's found guilty. And, and again, this is a technicality. This is this is something that the judge mm -hmm. saw as opposed to the, the merits of the case. It was how this case was handled. With that in mind, uh, a little bit of a slap there against the Secretary of State. A little mm -hmm. bit of a slap there against the County Attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, is Tom Horn a winner in this? In in I mean, he said I'm going to do this. He did it, and the judge said, "You're right." I think that remains no. to be seen, you know. But as yeah, and if he doesn't, if he doesn't um, refer it out, he's he's going to be a big loser because it certainly there's already this established conflict, but because it's him right. that they're looking into, so he can't. But I think it remains to be seen. I don't, I don't, I think winner. It's a little strong. It's a little strong, but again, it's, it's another example where he, he says the loss. Here's my point. Right. You got a secretary of state who wants to be governor. Uh, you got Tom Horn, who I think wanted to be governor. No. Um, but but does the secretary of state look bad when a judge says you didn't you didn't follow I, the I, rules? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think you know on this you know look Horn won the battle, but the war is still going right. on, yes. right? and it has not been decided. But but the other piece of it, and this is something I'm having my a hard time wrapping my head around, which is the longer you drag this on, the closer it gets to the 2014 race. He wants to be attorney general for another four years. You're dragging this on. We have a hearing, which is, keeps getting put back now, is in late May on that hit and run. Uh, I don't see anything positive. I think you, you, you deal with it. If you think that you can win, look, he had not only the theory that, A, there was insufficient evidence, that the phone calls didn't prove anything, but, B, the underlying theory that the campaign finance limits are too low and, therefore, the whole campaign finance law right. is invalid. And therefore, you could have won on that and put it behind you. Well, and, and every aspect of this case, is, as how I mean, every aspect of this, as long as it continues, he stays in the news for reasons that he doesn't want to stay in the news. No yes. Well, we, but obviously, can, he thinks he can win, and at the end of the day, if yeah. he does win, then he's then he has won. Right. You know, he so, gets, then he becomes a winner. Then he becomes but, but, <laughs> but I'm still. But, but even if he legally wins. He can legally beat, let, let's talk the hit and run here. He can say, I didn't realize I hit the car, you know, anything else, because, you know, the, the damage to the vehicle wasn't that substantial. Oh, come on, government overreach. He was persecuted. He was, there are all kinds of arguments he can make about but, how everybody was picking on but, him but all every, along. Well, and you see, it was true. Well, what was you, say, you, you saw how well that worked for Andy Thomas. Oh, see, I don't think so. Different. I think people understand certain things. What they will remember is hit and run, whether how, whether the damage, and that he was being followed and was with somebody who was not his I'm wife. I'm not saying but it's going to win in re-election. I'm just saying it's better than him saying, okay, let's just settle this thing quietly. I don't know. I'm not sure. 
Yeah, and you know, your obsession out here on the hit and run, I mean, that's not even what's at issue in this case. Oh, you know? understood, but so it's, part, it's all. It's a public perception. It's a public perception. Right, right. so. Sure. All right. Yeah. Well, all right, we're trying to pick winners and losers here, at least <laughs> see who that, won and lost. That's and our job. Sometimes it's a little, uh, it's a little <laughs> difficult to work. Okay, good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Monday on Arizona Horizon, we will look at home prices in the Valley and why some are concerned that those prices are increasing too much, too fast. And we'll learn about a local organization that houses orphans in South Africa. That's Monday evening, 5, 30, and 10 on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, we'll look at a Phoenix City project designed to cut energy costs and greenhouse gas emissions. Wednesday, it's our weekly legislative update with the Arizona Capital Times. Thursday, legislative leaders will join us for a bipartisan discussion on the issues facing Arizona. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.